This is me and my motorcycle. The goal is to rebuild it to a cool looking cafe racer inspired bike. I would guess all bike builders want their build to end up looking good. So my question is, why are there so many ugly cafe racers around? I know, how can I decide what's ugly and what's pretty? Because what some people like, others dislike. It's all subjective, isn't it? In this case, there's actually an objective definition for what's a good looking cafe racer. I'll come back to this pretty soon, but for now, just trust me on this. So, why are there so many ugly cafe racers around? Well, I think it's because of this. Bike builders do not follow the cafe racer design principles. It can be because of laziness, ignorance, stubbornness, lack of competence, or perhaps just because bike builders didn't even know about the design principles. And maybe you haven't heard about them either. I'll soon tell you about them. It's not my intention here to point fingers at others. I was heading in the wrong direction myself with this build. I was this close to end up with a ugly cafe racer. Luckily, I felt something was wrong. So I stopped the project, went back to the drawing board. For me, I think the reason was a combination of laziness, ignorance, and probably a lack of competence. I did know about the design principles and I wanted to do the right thing. But at the same time, I didn't really trust my own skills. And for the most challenging part of the project, I thought maybe I could get away doing more like a simplified, easy solution instead. Well, finally, I came to my senses and now I'm in the middle of redoing a lot of the work, like fitting this new seat hoop version 2. I got some very good feedback in my previous video. One of them was to match this angle on the rear part of the seat hoop with the angle here on the tank. And this is actually one of the cafe racer design principles. I also asked for feedback when it comes to the rear fender. Should I use the bulky one or the slim one? Most thought the bulky one, the big one, was best. I agree. The plan now is to get the rear subframe and this seat hoop version 2 done. I have made the upswing on the rear part of the seat hoop by cutting several parallel cuts on the top of the pipe. The cutting disc is uh, one millimeter thick and it's a 10 millimeter distance between each cut. I have a pipe bender as well, but making a small bend very close to an existing bend and getting it precise, that's not easy. This is a safer method. I'm using brute force bending it upwards and then welding it back together into one solid piece. Making a steeper angle on the rear upswing makes better room for the rear fender and I hope now it matches the angle on the tank as well. Having matching angles is actually rule number 8 according to the cafe racer design principles I am using. And perhaps now it's the time to tell you about this. What I'm referring to is an article named How to build a cafe racer written by Charlie Trelogan and published in the Bike Exif magazine back in 2014. The author is a car designer by trade, in addition to being a motorcycle and cafe racer enthusiast. The article describes nine design rules, and here are the illustrations from the article. It's not really rules. Charlie says in the article, and I quote, These guidelines are just that, guidelines. However, I would say if you don't follow any of these, well, then you're not really building a cafe racer. I have made my own illustrations using my build. And the numbers 1 to 9 is just something I have added. My build is uh, not a pure cafe racer. It's more like a hybrid between a brat and a scrambler style. So I will jump in between of uh, Charlie's illustrations and mine. And perhaps first of all, show you the goal of my build. I want to keep somewhat of a 80s style. As you can see here, using the classic Honda HRC racing color scheme. Rule number 1 is called the foundation. It's a flat line and two fairly evenly sized wheels. I think my build is within tolerances for this rule, although I have an oddly shaped tank with a bend downwards. I try to balance it out with the decals on the tank going upwards. Looking at the classic cafe racer from the articles, this is even more perfect. The next rule is the cutoff point. Keeping the mass in the center of the bike helps it look symmetrical and balanced. Going beyond these lines is okay as long as it's not very dominant. 
I would say my build meets the criteria here quite well. I have selected to break the third rule. Since I have a scrambler-ish build, I did not want clip-on handlebars. I removed the original dashboard and tried to keep the height as uh, low as possible when it comes to the handlebar. But here you can see a perfect solution. It gives the bike a much more aggressive look when you keep it within the height limit. The bone line is hugely important in car design and it's important here as well. It serves to describe the widest point of the bodywork. Keeping the center of the lamp on the bone line works very well. Here you can see my build. I'm quite satisfied with it, although I don't have the traditional tail cowl to tie in uh, to the line at the rear end. It's uh, quite much more challenging to get a decent cafe racer look on a newer motorcycle compared to using one from the 60s or 70s. You can on some bikes just buy a kit with a new seat and a tail cowl and you're halfway there. Bikes from the 80s or 90s do have a quite a different frame design and requires much more work, like on my Honda here from 1984. Here I'm making modifications on the front part of the original seat hoop to make it meet up with the new one. I'm using the same technique, cutting a bit bigger slices to get a tighter bend. The next rule is the visual weight, and that's the main mess of the bike. It's uh, best if the engine and tank approximately has the same width and if the middle of the cylinders on the engine is where the peak of the tank is. I think my build is spot on when it comes to this rule. Then comes a rule where I barely comply. Since I have made this uh, upswing at the rear of my seat hoop, with the rear fender tucked up under it, the swoop line is not totally off. This is however a perfect execution of it, with a classic tail cowl that makes it look like it once was one piece with a cut out for the seat. As long as you're breaking just some of the rules, not all of them, and it's done intentionally and carefully, it can still be a great result design-wise. It can lead to both innovation and variation, and that's a good thing. The seat hoop is made. I used the same technique, made some cuts here and then bent the pipe at the front end of the seat hoop inwards so it meets up with this original part of the seat hoop. This should now fit exactly here. Hopefully this is now perfect so I get the bone line and all the angles correct. Crossing my fingers. I guess it's just to start welding this now. I have prepared this first uh, frame, uh, what is this called? This part, not sure really. This angled piece of the frame. Supported it here with uh, different kind of uh, pipes. So it is straight. Welding time. Rule number seven, main angles. Here, the rear subframe is perfectly matching the angle of the front fork. I know the original subframe on this Honda CX500 is quite curved, so the builder has done a good job on making the custom subframe. Having straight lines and in parallel really makes it look cohesive. I did not get mine completely in parallel, but it's not very far off. And the number eight, secondary line, it's much the same, just typical for smaller areas where you should try to match two or more lines. And I think actually my build is better than the example in the article. And then it's just one rule remaining. And it's perhaps the one most builders do not take seriously enough. But before I reveal it, perhaps you want to see me finishing up the build first. So, this is the last part on the subframe. Just uh, putting on tech welds now. Uh, just to make sure everything is uh, correct. And then um, I will uh, take off the frame, remove the engine, so I can do proper welding. I need to make a bracket for the tank though, but uh, some final welds now, and I hope it will be decent.
this is somewhat exciting. First time I've seen the new seat hoop welded on subframe, even the shocks. Yeah, this is exciting. Then it's just to put on a bracket here so I can put on the tank. But first, it's time to reveal the final rule, fork distance. On a true cafe racer, you want to keep the front wheel as tucked in as possible. A lot of people are against this because it will change the riding experience. Design-wise, it does look better. And I have done it on my build as well. Not that much though, about one inch. The bike becomes more responsive when the wheel distance becomes shorter. But it might not be that much since a wider wheel makes the bike less responsive. So these mods uh, cancel each other out. My last job is now to fabricate a new tank bracket. This piece is not visible, at least when the tank and the seat is installed. It's barely visible when removing the seat, so well, I try to make it halfway decent. The bracket is uh, made. Looks like this. And uh, if you wonder about this edge here, it's because I'm gonna put this rubber in between. And I'm so sick and tired of losing this rubber piece. So now I think, uh, yeah, with this uh, kind of shelf uh, design, it will not disappear for me, I hope. Maybe I should have made a more design-wise uh, prettier solution than this strange bracket here. It doesn't really match up with all the other nice lines, is it? But uh, when it comes to this, I thought it was smart because of the function. Now I have a channel here, possibility to put cables or maybe even a small compartment. Because I'm lifting the tank much higher now than the original position in, uh, at the rear end. I have quite a big gap here all the way. So I thought this was smart. And normally the tank will be put on the bike and then I think this design-wise look okay, don't you think? Let me know if you would have done it uh, differently. Maybe there is a better solution I haven't thought of. So, how does it look? Are the lines where they should be? I almost made a mistake. I started to measure the bike, but of course my garage floor is not in level, it's tilting downwards, so uh, when it's wet in here, I want the water to leave the garage, out the garage door. So, but uh, in this direction, my garage should, should be in uh, level. So I'll check now how this looks. Pretty much uh, horizontal here, in level. This one as well. So uh, as the bike is right now, it's, uh, the bone line is quite uh, horizontal. What do you think? Does it look uh, decent? I think uh, I'm pretty sure I would like to replace this shock with a taller one. Let me know if you know about the replacement shock that is um, 35, 36 centimeters in length. Or I will need to yeah, modify the mount here or I think, I think that will do it. Get a bit more clearance here, get this a bit higher. Bike normally looks a bit more ag aggressive when it's leaning forward. Since this is a scramblerish ish uh, I think uh, having um, it a bit tall, both in the front and the rear, that has to be allowed. I would like to know what you think about the design principles. Let me know if you want me to dive even deeper into the guidelines. I have uh, got a couple of emails from the author. Maybe I can ask him a bit more if uh, something you're wondering about. 
or not agreeing about when it comes to the design. That's all for this time. Hope you enjoy the build and the video. Hope to see you again later. Bye-bye.